I guess today I want to talk a bit about um, what I think is the core of this decentralized network that we're building. And I think that's also leading into Nature 2.0. So thanks, JP, for pointing it out. And Trent, those two sitting together. That's kind of like a, a hive mind there. Um, so let's jump right in. Do you think that all resources on the planet are actually property of humans? Well, we did that. Right? We made everything owned by humans. And we're doing the same in outer space as well. Do you know how you call a forest that owns itself? Well, a self-owned forest. Uh, there's even a name for it. It's called a deodant. Uh, it's from a sci-fi lecture. Or think about decentralized energy production that's just there for consumption. So people don't really own the grid, but people collaborate in, in sharing the resources to build up that infrastructure, that public utility that you have. And now it's time to put on my hippie shoes, which I actually did. Um, so honestly, I, I think capitalism is dying. It's dying out, and I think that people like Jeff Bezos probably are one of the lost monopolists. And, and I mean this in the sense that it's dying that we're stri these firms strive to get a lot of revenue for the stakeholders at the cost of their consumers. And I think that's not how we, that's not sustainable. What I think is that we should look and explore towards more is the commons. It's where we share resources, where we manage collaboratively our resources. There's a really nice Medium post about decentralized autonomous cooperatives. I advise you to read it. And it's all about making a system that we can manage together, that we know that we can actually start sharing resources. And I find myself so lucky in this space because I think here we are at some seat of commons, at the digital commons. Our shared resource is code, open source code. It's also feedback through meetups like this. We don't really work with trade secrets or patents. We work in collaboratively improvement of this space. We have bigger fish to fry than to be in competition with these networks. We want to prove something. The digital commons exist. There is a lot of reason to make this happen. But I think we can go a step further. Like, these digital commons are sometimes not tangible, and we don't always have a reason to contribute. But what if it's about real resources, physical resources? Can we collaboratively manage them? And do we have the right incentives to do so? Can we live in a world of abundance rather than taking away scarce resources from specific groups? You can think about empathic protocols and agents that, that, that establish that. But I just want to show this by a little example. Um, it's a TED talk that I recently saw, and it's about desertification. Desertification is this, uh, this thing that's happening in the world due to global heating, but also a lot of other factors where good land becomes desert. It becomes unusable for people, for the commons. But there is a guy called Alan Savory that actually, well, he first had to shoot 40,000 elephants, a uh, failed experiment. Uh, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, so he felt a bit guilty and kept on moving. And 30 years later, he figured that if you, have, if you just replicate nature at its best, and you have moving cattle, that cattle will trample the, the dirt and it will leave a layer of um, soil and, and, and manure. But he cannot stay at the same place because in nature it would be haunted by predators and it will always move around. So we figured, what if we replicate this? What if we have plant grazing and we move that cattle along across a grid, a specific path, what would happen? Well, these are results that are happening in two, three years. So the moist, the that from those showers doesn't immediately disappear. 
because the cattle trample, trampled it, didn't stay at, at one place, so it didn't put it too hard. The CO2 stays the same. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to, to, to start thinking about what if we collaboratively manage big pieces of our Earth? Now, we are in the blockchain space, and we think that's maybe just a little bit of technology. I love to add too much technology to stuff and see what happens, but let's just start with a little bit. There's blockchains. There's a lot of ways to frame blockchains. One of them would be a chain of blocks or a shared state. Some people call it a trust machine because it adds that layer of cryptography and a lot of decentralization, not the central point of failure or control. But we think it's more than that. We think it's an incentive machine. It's something that makes people do stuff. And it happened with the Bitcoin ledger. That's like one of the most obvious examples that people actually did stuff. They started spinning up their computers, running the network. Then they said, well, hey, I see that I get a reward every 10 minutes if I add enough computing power to this network. So this reward gives me Bitcoin. And with Bitcoin, I can buy stuff on the assassination market. Awesome. Well, what it actually does is it makes people pool a resource. That resource is computing power. We measure it in hash power, hash rate. You can see that it's like, of course, blown out of proportion. People have been building it on FPGAs, created specific chips called ASICs. And it only optimizes for one thing, security. Secure the network, get a reward. But what if we take this thing, this reward functions, this incentive, this kind of lottery, and make it a multi-objective system, where you have a lot of good behaviors that you can reward. Then we can create something that we call public utility networks. These are networks of utilities. They're just there. People need them. We think of utilities as energy, clean water, food, shelter. There's so much things more, like bandwidth, uh, intelligence, data. The list is long. Uh, we can discuss the list afterwards. Um, and then people found, well, if these are networks that are just there, their utility, nobody can really stop them. That means that we can use them to create something that stays going and going and going and going until maybe the technology is overrun by another technology. It's very, very difficult to stop. It allows us to create something al autonomously. And that's maybe the most interesting point in time that we are right now. We are at a point in time where we can create non-human agents that can own stuff, they can own resources, they can have legal status, they can make decisions, and nobody can stop them. I think that's a turning point for humanity. Think of it as a good computer virus, depending on the coders. Um, but it can also be governance, of course. You have to guide it. You have to treat it as a child, the code as a child that you want to grow up, and you curate its abilities. Now, let's add too much technology. Let's add some AI to it, intelligence, to this substrate. Think we have an unstoppable substrate, and now we're going to put in artificial intelligence on top of that substrate. What would happen? It's something we call AI DAOs. Yeah, so those decentralized AI uh, autonomous organizations that are running on a decentralized processing substrate. So this means that once they are out there, they start making decisions. They start owning resources, giving away resources. And we have these algorithms that nobody really, we can move them around, but nobody can control or own them which is way more interesting than, for example, having an Amazon or Google or an Alibaba or whatnot actually own those algorithms. And those algorithms they implement are typically made to make consumers make bad decisions because they guide our consumer behavior. So these things are way more transparent. They're out there. But, of course, we have to guide them. Here's uh, some quotes from my co-founder, Trent. Um, it's about how to give AI rights, how to make it a new life form. 
So given that corporations have rights, you could start a corporation. And then you create a decentralized autonomous <coughs> corporation, meaning that you put the rules of that corporation onto a decentralized substrate. And then you start cutting away the human influence and replacing it by intelligence. There is a few interesting things here. A DAO has been recognized by Malta as a legal entity, so it's possible. A river in New Zealand has legal status, so it's possible. So we can actually create those new entities that are non-human. What could these entities be? What, what could they do? Well, think about a logistical substrate that we're here in Berlin we have a lot of car sharing. We also have a lot of um, bike sharing. But it doesn't really make sense to put that on a blockchain. And there is one reason why. Because there is a company owning those assets. So they don't need decentralized access control. They just need centralized access control. But what if the community starts from, well, we expect to consume so much of this resource. In this, It could be a car or a bike. So we as consumers dictate how much should be manufactured. And our consumption is a reflection of our ownership. Work and equity, work and ownership merge into one thing. And at the current state of capitalism, these are two separate worlds. You could think about cars, trucks, maybe the infrastructure, the trucks paying to the roads, um, making sure that there's just enough consumption and there's just enough payment to sustain this. There doesn't have to be like an advantage for founders or something like that. It's a utility. There doesn't have to be a, a margin for profit. You can think about those self-owning wind farms or maybe the full decentralized grid. We could also think about forests that sustain themselves. Forests that have this legal entity running on a blockchain People come in, they take out wood, they pay to the forest. The forest uses that funds to maybe hire people to nurture the forest, or maybe hire a swarm of drones to map out how it looks like. What I think is that the seed that we're trying to plant here is that we want to build something like the digital commons, and we want to augment it with incentives. We think about, we, we're mostly instant gratification monkeys. We think, well, if we can get some early reward or a fixed reward, we'll go for that. So what if we can turn that into something sustainable for the commons? You give somebody a reward, but by doing so, they're actually contributing to a collaborative resource. There's some very interesting things like FOMO 3D and Proof of Weak Hands 3D, which are smart contracts like lotteries. They play on that instant gratification but they bring out the worst of people. So how can we convert that, and that's a bit of a question, into bring out the best of people? So for this we do stuff like token engineering, which is basically a lot of mechanism design, it's game theory, and we treat it as a discipline, as an engineering discipline. How can we design incentives into systems, like blockchains, in order to make people do stuff, but do the right stuff for the commons? So coming back to that early example of how to guide uh, the cattle across the certified land, well, maybe we do need to map out what is the certified. Maybe that land is owned by itself. Maybe it hires some drones to guide the cattle. And we all benefit from it. Of course, this is too much technology for what we want to do, but it just gives you an idea of Things don't have to be owned by humans. They just have to be collaboratively managed. And of course, then you can start thinking about complex and compound systems. They can, might be able to evolve themselves. And as you could think is that in Nature 2.0, you're connected so much to the substrate that nobody really knows that you're a teapot or nobody knows you're a forest. Nobody knows you're a grid but you're just an agent in the system. So we are evolving. We are at a very cool point in time. And I think the stuff that Jan Peter is doing is really laying down the tracks
for builders. Having people build this stuff, layer by layer by layer. And they do that with the Dutch chain hackathon really well. Well, Sierra was pretty amazing. We already had a few of those layers in place. With Ocean Protocol, we're looking at decentralized intelligence. And yeah, I mean, we just have to build it. It's not a matter of if it's possible, it's just let's do it. So that's it. <laughs>